we've been working with Patrick, which is here, uh, for about a year on um, reversing games and fuzzing games, online games particularly. And uh, before I start, we have a bunch of questions for you guys. Uh, the first one would be, how many of you ever play online games? Please raise your hand. All right. Some people don't, okay. <laughs> Didn't expect that. How many of you ever thought of cheating? Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. How many of you really succeeded in doing that? <laughs> all right. Well, so all of you probably everyone who tried to cheat at one game like Diablo 3 or uh, League of Legends, which would be the focus of the talk today, uh, realized quickly that it is very, very hard. And when we started to do the, the presentation for this talk, uh, we had two options. The first option was, well, how about doing a talk where we show you a bunch of attacks or a bunch of how we crash games. And uh, the second one was more into uh, telling you how we did it. And uh, we decided to take the later route because I've been, uh, since I've been doing a lot of uh, uh, fuzzing and a lot of reversing on games for the last three years, I have been cruising a bunch of forums. And most of the thing I read is, uh, I know assembly code, I, need C I know C++, uh, how do I do reversing games? And most of the skill sets that you need to do that are not your standard reverse technique uh, idea or skill set. So what we hope to you to get from this talk is ideas on how next time you want to test a game, not for cheating of course, but for intellectual uh, satisfaction, you have the right skill sets, right? <laughs> yeah. By the way, if you start shooting at Diablo 3, I would be super angry because I'm still playing it, so please hold for a little while before you start doing that. Thank you. Uh, it's a very, very tough place, and over the last year, we met a lot of incredible people, and before starting, we want to acknowledge them because they did some of the work, and we didn't want to take credit for it. So we want to uh, thank particularly Drew. Uh, Moises, which did a lot of work on Diablo 3, and Intline 9, which did a lot of work on League of Legends, and they act we are building on what they did, and we helped them along the way, and they helped us, so it's really like they should be there together with us, uh, at least here in spirit, I guess. Um, so, why fuzzing online game is so hard? Well, in theory, it's super simple. You have a server, and you have a game, and nothing special in it, except a few things. First, well, you don't have the server. When you try to first, let's say, a Apache or a FTP server, you usually have the binary as a release, so you can actually instrument it, look how it works, and you can relaunch it and stuff. When you are fuzzing games, you don't. You simply don't have the server. The server is something out of your reach. You don't know how it works. You don't know uh, how it's run, on which platform it is run. It's completely uh, obscure to you. And by the way, do not fuzz games server. Fuzzing game server is illegal and I have to put this disclaimer somewhere. Do not try to fuzz Diablo 3 gamer server. I never tell you to do that. Do not do that. Uh, you can tr maybe fuzz the client that may be illegal. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure fuzzing server is illegal. Uh, yeah. The second thing is uh, when you look at the protocol, over the time they became more and more complicated. I'm going to tell you more about uh, the one about Diablo 3 and the one on League of Legends, but most of them, uh, maybe except Formville, uh, how very, very complex and encrypted and you don't really know what's inside so it's really hard to just fire up a sniper and just look at packet won't give you much these days. You have to really work harder on that. And finally, well, uh, games try to do the best they can to prevent you for uh, debugging the, the code so they have uh, anti-debugging techniques. They also have active security checks. Uh, the most well-known would be the Warden. I'm going to give you a few words on this in a few slides, uh, which is Blizzard uh, Active Security Checker, and they have a very, very, very complex piece of code. Uh, you're looking at huge binary with a ton of DLLs, so if you just say, well, I'm going to just reverse it, let's pop up ADA or uh, any type of analysis, and you're going to fail because it's just too big. And then when you look at that, you like this. That's actually my usual face, which is like, ooh, that hurts, it's really hard, and you make no progress. Uh, when Patrick joined me like six months ago, he spent probably like two months doing zero progress. It's like very frustrating, and uh, we don't you want you guys to feel the same, so we try to give you a point of how to not be stuck. It's possible, 
and most people are like this in the forum. I don't know what to do. How am I starting? What is the thing I should need to know? Well, friends, there is hope. It is possible to first game. It is possible to have results. You just have to be very creative and we really have to think out of the box and use some sort of technique that you might not feel like are linked to reverse but actually are really useful. And yes, I'm going to give you statistics and yes, we're going to do some mathematical analysis of packets because at some point, as you will see, there is no other way. And it actually would be faster than just reverse the thing. So what we really want you to take out from this talk is uh, the new techniques or the techniques revamped to first games that we come across uh, over the last year and then you can take them home and try to play with them and hopefully you will help a bunch of open source projects that are around games and a lot of good come out of that. So here's our master plan for today. Uh, we have the game, we have the server, so what we try to do usually is we try to be, to be in between. We want to have our tool to actually intercept the traffic and be able to see the packets and there is here is our first twist is we also want our tool to correlate that with uh, memory offsets. One of the things which is very powerful is when you combine network traffic with uh, memory analysis because you know what packet affect which state and then you can write things like if I see this packet, what are the packet I see when this value climbs up or which value comes down and so forth. So it's actually a very useful uh, technique for to combine both of them. So today we're going to show you four things. Uh, one is how do you intercept traffic, which is the first step. Then how you have to bypass encryption. So uh, every game uses encryption, so you have to to, be, to do that before doing any works. Then how do you reverse the traffic? When you have decrypted your packets, how do you actually uh, come up with a understanding of what it is? And then uh, we fi finish by telling you a little bit of when you have the packet and you have the ability to first and you sort of know what you want to do, uh, how you monitor the results on the client side. So, intercepting traffics. Uh, there is mainly three ways for intercepting traffics. Uh, the first one is you take your game and you do something which is well known, which is DRL injections. Uh, I'm speaking of Windows, Windows games. Uh, for Linux fans, it's more like a LD preload where you try to overwrite a specific set of functions. The other one is you work at the OS level and where you have to write a driver or you use a VM, uh, you put your game into the VM, depending on how uh, graphic intensive is your game, you might or might not be able to do that and then you write a driver which is going to intercept the packets before they leave the box and before they hit the router or the last way is to actually have the network or the IP advisor and just do this uh, interception after the packets leave the box. Um, okay. So, hooking Winsock. So most of the games in Windows use Winsocks, which is a Windows socket API, which is a standard way to send and receive packets. I have yet to see a game which doesn't use it. Uh, and basically there is a couple of functions that you want to basically overwrite. Uh, the first one is connect, which allow you to manipulate where the game connects. The second one is receive when for receiving packets and the third one is obviously sending packets. These are the three functions that you want to hook and there is two ways mainly to do that. Uh, the first one is to use Microsoft Data Libraries, uh, which is a way for you to write a DLL which says I want to intercept this, this, this and this and then it's going to inject a DLL into the game and you would have like a bypass to these functions. Uh, the other one if you don't want to use Detour and there is a lot of discussion in the communities on what is the best way to do, you can actually not use with Microsoft Detour and use a, a, um, IAT hooking which is basically you write the table of the, the pointer directly by yourself and then they are going to go to, you, to, your, to your function and then you return to the real functions. Uh, that's where things come become harder when you do a game. If you do that on, let's say on, mob on a browser like IE it works perfectly. If you do that on Diablo 3 uh, you have to face a warden. So what is a warden? So warden is the uh, code name for Blizzard anti cheating engine. Um, it is meant basically to do four, three things. The first thing which we know most about is it reads a certain uh, offset in the memory. So it looks at different offsets in the game and try to see if these offsets have been modified in any ways. It also scan uh, the list of process you have run on your computer for known uh, bots or known uh, executable uh, like debuggers, um, 
packet interceptors, sniper and so forth and report it to Blizzard and last thing uh, it actually seems to be able to run a blob of code. So basically sometimes it fetch a blob of code and just run it and returns the result to Blizzard. What it means for us is that if you use hooking you will get caught. You will. There is like no uh, some you might not be caught right away because you might inject or hook a little bit differently than the receive or send function and you can be upper upper this function but sometimes they will figure this out and you get caught because the wardens can for every time ways of injecting the LRs. So the other options that we we sort of work uh we use for the last six months is uh use a uh, writer driver. Uh, two years ago, we were starting to do uh, using LSP, which was the old way to do it by Microsoft. Uh, there was a, actually a talk at DEF CON 15 on that. Uh, it's uh, to tell you how old it is, like five or six years old. Uh, there is a new one we came out, which is actually easier. So if you want to look at doing that, the easiest way to do it is to use the uh, Windows filter platform, uh, which uh, make basically you can tell I want to intercept TCP connection or I want to intercept uh, the stream on top of it, and it make it easier for you because it's going to resync uh, TCP counter for you and so forth. So it's pretty good. Um, the thing you have to be careful when you write the driver is actually the driver, what you do is basically you stop the packets to go to the server and you re-inject them. The problem when you do that with the driver is your own packet are going to go back to your own driver so you have to tag them. It seems easy to explain. Uh, when you implement it it's sort of tricky and you might find weird bugs like having the same packet sent twice to the server and so forth. So you have to be careful. Um, on a side note, um, you can't really redirect uh, IPs. So I saw that a bunch of time in the forums. People say, well, but what you can do is simply tell Diablo tree to uh, go and connect to uh, your own IP. There is like a command line option for that. Uh, the truth is it used to work in beta. In, re in release, you can't do that. Uh, basically, the, uh, the server send a packet, a challenge packet to Diablo tree uh, with the IP of the server and if it actually doesn't match the list it has into a DLR which is downloaded every time you launch a game, uh, it's going to refuse to look to connect. So you actually have to, uh, the Diablo tree has to believe that you connect to the right IP otherwise you can't actually uh, launch a game. And some people will say well but I can hook these functions. Well, if you hook this function, the warden is going to catch you, so you can't do that. You have to either reroute the IP to a different box or you have to do the driver interceptions. So, to summarize this part, uh, you can do DLN injections and it works fine on games which don't have like uh, active checks, uh, like League of Legends. Uh, that's probably the current way of doing it for League of Legends. When you deal with games which are really, really secure, like Diablo 3, you have to do something more. Um, more fancy. Uh, we use driver for a very good reason is as I said in, in my master plan, I want to be able to read the game state. I want to be able to correlate packets with what is happening in the memory and the only way for me to do that is be on the same computer. I, I might be able to do it with a second box but I have to do socket and so forth and there will be some latency which might not be uh which might, mis might seem trickier so our current approach what we recommend to do is actually use a driver and use uh, the uh, WPF way of doing it just intercept packets. That's how we did it. Um, encryptions. Uh, let's start with the easy one, League of Legends. So League of Legends use Blowfish. I have no idea why they choose Blowfish which is slow but somehow someone they must have read that Blowfish is great so they implemented Blowfish. Uh, so League of Legends have two binary, one which is the launcher where you find your game and then you click play and it launches your game. Uh, the interesting part of that is actually when you click on launch, the key with the Blowfish key appears in the command line. <laughs> so they have some sort of encryption. Um, not a big deal. Uh, let's, let's go back to something way more complicated, uh, enter Diablo 3. All right. So you have the game and you have the battle.net server which is the first server you connect to. So the first thing you're going to do is what is called a SRP6 challenge uh, which is basically a way for you to uh, prove that you have the right login and password without transmitting without transmitting it in clear. It's a six step protocol. I'm not going into details. Uh, if you look Google SRP6 you're going to find it. Uh, the basic idea is you hash your password uh, with like a secret, uh, with a nonce, and then you exchange that with a uh, some sort of DFN man uh, crypto, 
And basically, the network attacker has no way to brute force your password. That's why it's pretty good. It's actually very, very the right way to do that. And when you have done that, uh, what you obtain is a secret key, which is shared between the battlenet server and the game, and you change out every instant of the game, of course. And then you use that to start TLS. So you do TLS PS key, which is pressured key. So basically, they start to do TLS instead of using certificate uh, to exchange the keys. They actually use the keys they have used in SRP6. And when this is done, and you say, okay, I can do all of this, ah, you have the RSA challenge. And I'm going to explain you in a little bit what is the RSA challenge is. And then after that, you actually connect to a second server, which is what we call the game server, where the actual game occurs. You know, when you click play, actually you are moving to another server. And no, Blizzard do not put the key into the command line. Not this time. So, why a RSA challenge? So TLS PS key <coughs> is basically using SSL uh, with a press shared key, which is the one you exchange it during the um, uh, the um, the SRP6 challenge, and it should be perfectly fine for us because, well, I know my password, so I can recreate the SRP6 challenge on my uh, interception mechanism. Um, and so there is no way for Blizzard to know that it's an end to end connection, so they use a RSA challenge so the client expects a message which is signed with the private key of Blizzard, and if this is not showed by, uh, if it's not valid, then um, the game will refuse to launch again. It's actually located into the password DLL. Um, so basically, what happened is we don't know the key, we don't know Blizzard private key, and the game expects. Uh, you to have this challenge shined by the private key of Blizzard, otherwise it will refuse to launch. So it's a way for them to do authentications. And it's actually perfectly meant to be, uh, prevent what exactly what we want to do, which is man in the middle attacks. Um, so there is two ways to bypass the challenge. Uh, one is you go into factor S RSA key, which is, uh, as far as I can tell, impossible. Or you go into patch the game. But if you patch the game, you know what happened? The warden is going to go after you. Remember the warden which look at the offset? They actually look at the offset of the key. So if you try to change the key or change the task, they're going to catch you. So that's probably what a happy face you make. And you're like, okay, that's become complicated. So you start to thinking, well, maybe I can do put into debug mode, swap when during the challenge and be very quick and remove the swap. Or I might intercept the warden and I might actually trick the warden into not scanning the right offset. And then you, you look more and more, and then you realize something really deep. Traffic to the game server is not encrypted. <laughs> so when you realize that, you're like, yes, I can't, uh, so you can't, what it means is we can monitor the game by itself, but we can't do for auction, auction a house uh, protocol is encrypted. So if you want to basically try to fuzz the auction out, and again it's illegal, uh, you might not be able to do that because these packets are encrypted. So they protect your login, uh, the character selection, and the auction house. If you just want to be in the game like bashing monster and doing quest, this is not encrypted. So that's the part we focus with. And so at that point, we give up on managing the middling everything and we just like let the, go the game do all the authentication for itself and we pick up uh, the connection after all this is done and we just uh, give up on basically the auction, um, the hash and so forth. All right. Reversing protocol. Um, here's what a Diablo 3 uh, game packet look like. So they use TCP and on top of TCP they use RPC which is remote procedure call so they send a lot of calls to the server say do this, do that, uh, for instance, uh, I'm facing this, uh, I'm going there, and then the server is going to say, um, play this animation, or I'm going to kill this monster. So basically, you, you say, I'm going to attack there, and the server is going to send you back um, how much DPS you did, because all the computation are done on the server side to prevent cheating again. Um, and then on top of that, they use uh, what we call protobuf. Uh, protobuf is a way to uh, create a nested protocol which is developed by Google. There is an open source implementation of that. Uh, the community has created a C sharp version of it, so you have it for Python, C, and Java, and C sharp currently available uh, open source. 
And if you want to know what a uh, Diablo 3 package looks like, uh, this is a package which is half reversed. Um, so you have, uh, this is an attack packet. So when you attack packet, this is what we have been able to isolate. So you have something which is like an aim target message. Uh, where you have three fields, we believe that it's actually five or six fields, we don't know exactly how to split it yet. And then you have uh, the location where you want to hit, which is like three coordinate, which are at the bottom of the screen. This is the kind of stuff you're going to get and you can see it's a part above because it has a uh, nested uh, component and that's how they probably say uh, them. they have like a bunch of components and you unlock them. On the other side, League of Legends use something completely different, they use UDP, and on top of that they use inet which is a reliable uh, connection on top of uh, UDP. On top of that they have Blofish and on top of that they have a new protocol which is the League of Legends protocol which has their own custom protocol which is the thing you care deeply about. So inet is just a way to multiplex. Um, basically the, LOL, the League of Legends packet format is something like this. You have an opcode which tells you what the action is followed by uh, an ID which is a um, integer, 32 bits, uh, little Indian, and then followed by some content. And then they are multiplexing across multiple channels and each channel have a set of flags. So you usually have like four or five channels and one or two flags uh, for this. Usually three is for sending information and one is for receiving information or something like that. And then you're like, at that point you feel pretty good. You're like, well, okay, now I'm, I know the protocol, I, I'm able to manipulate it, I'm happy, I did all the hard work, right? Seems fair and, um, and from now it should be done here. Well, let's take some check. Uh, we recorded a game which lasted 21 minutes and in 21 minutes we get 60,000 packets. That's a lot of data to process. And on average you get about 48 packets a second, so if you try to do that with a sniper, well, you won't see anything. If you try to process that with a sniper, well, it's going to take you a lot of time and we have isolated 78 uh, different opcodes so there's also a lot of different packets. Uh, so if you want to grab that, you, we have some bursts to up to 80% or 90, uh, 90 packets a second at some point and then it's very, very, very uh, uh, oscillating and it's not, hard, not easy to do something like with that and then, well, yeah, there is too much stuff to process. You, you can't just look at it and just figure out what it is because it's actually too much data. Well, there is no such thing as too much data, you know. Uh, having a lot of data is good because if we have a lot of data, we can start to do something like statistical analysis and don't be afraid, it's pretty easy uh, to actually figure out a lot of things by themselves and then use that. So what I propose to do from there is first we're going to bucket which is basically split the traffic by opcode because we know that each opcode is some of sort of uh, separated and then try to do some what I call differential analysis I'm going to show you how it works. Then we're going to try to mutate this to do the fuzzing and then we can inject the code and just look at the data and see how it's going to work. So bucketing is very simple. All you do is you look at the opcode and you say well if it's opcode A I'm going to put it into the bucket A and if it's B I'm going to put it into the bucket B and that's all there is to it. So it's not hard and it's going to be like tw uh, four lines of Python or something. And then you have your bucket and then you can work on each of them in isolations. When you have each bucket what you do is you take each packet and what you're going to do is you're going to do the first packet followed by the second packet and you're going to look at how many of them ha are differences in the same offset. So you're going to compare offset by offset which is like column by column uh, and you compare all of them. And for instance, you can see that for the first uh, offset, uh, the value is from 2 to 9. We have the range because the, lo the lowest one is 0, 2, and the highest one is 0, 9. And the second one hasn't moved, so it's basically some sort of static field, either an identifier or a, a split a separator or something like that. And the, th the third one is also uh, separated. When you have that, you have to do a second step where uh, what you do is you do uh, differential an analysis between traces. So you have one traces which might have this shape where the first uh, offset is viable, the second one is fixed, the third one is fixed and then you for instance look with for the second player trace and you compare those two. And what you can see from there is that of course the first offset have variations, the second one is fixed but actually the third one is also viable because it's probably the ID of the user or ID of the player so you can actually get more data. Um, 
If you want all of this, uh, I put all the differential analysis on the League of Legends protocol into the uh, the GitHub. If you look for uh, League of Legends uh, init uh, line, you're going to find them. I have all of them in public. Um, and when you have that, well, you can say, well, now I can fuzz everything. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every range, and for each range, I'm going to just, you know, just mutate all of those. Well, the problem is it looks like this. It's uh, what we call the curse of dimensional dimensionality. If you try to have one bucket which change, it's perfectly fine. If you have seven range which actually change, even if you try to do four uh, mutation by range and combine all of those, you're going to end up with millions and millions of packets. Uh, to give you an idea, <coughs> when we try to generate all the fuzzing um, uh, vectors for the Lo uh, League of Legends client, uh, and we only use three value, which is mi minimum, maximum, and median value, uh, we ended up with 1.5 million packets. And the problem is League of Legends is very brittle, the client. So every, most of the time we actually crash the client. So, and the problem is then you have to click on relaunch the game, reset the, con uh, res reset the, uh, the game and then click and then start and even if you automate that with let's say auto it then you have to do it in super slow so, uh, well, you have to take it to the next level. It's not good enough. Even if you are to that point where you know what is fixed, what is not fixed, and you're able to try to do all the fuzzing, you're not good enough. Um, you need something better. So you can start with something very simple. You can look at frequency analysis. Uh, this is the plot. Uh, what you can see here is by opcode, and it's a logarithmic scale, so uh, the biggest bar are actually way higher than they look up here on the diagram. Um, some opcode are very, very frequent. There's, there are mainly pings and uh, update on location and stuff like that, which are not really what you are interested in. On the other hand, there is a handful opcode which are very, very, very rare. And these are the ones you actually care about. Why? Uh, because the small stuff is usually the good stuff. For instance, when you do a level up, well, level up is not that often. You're not going to level up every second, so you might have like four or five of those into the trace. Uh, same thing for buying items. You do not buy like 20 items you, or a million items. You buy maybe 10, 20 items, so it's very, very low. And same thing for attacking. You do not attack that often, so there is very, very few packets. So if you discard all the stuff which is very, very frequently updated, then you end up with a small chunk of opcode which are more manageable to do. Uh, that being said, uh, remember it's an online game, so when you send a comment, you also want to know what the answer is linked to it. The problem is with uh, League of Legends that I said, there is multiple packets and they sort of multiplex each other, so it's actually hard to know which one is related to one another. So you need to actually uh, do correlations between uh, opcodes. Uh, for instance, when you have an attack trigger, you want to know uh, what is the response from the server for that, or when you do assign a new skill, what you really want to know is, well, what is the server entering to me and how I can play with that. So. To do that, you do something which is fairly standard, which is called n-gram analysis. It's very, a big word for, and uh, I'm going to show you a big gram, it's actually a big word for something which is that simple. What you do is you take the, f you only take the opcode, and then you take the first packet, and then the second packet, and then you say, well, I see these two opcode one after the other one time. And then you move and you say, well, I see these two opcode one after the other one time, and so forth. And at the end, if you repeat across all the trace, uh, you're going to get some of them which are more frequent than other. And it's going to get actually rid of the noise. So if you actually trigger uh, something multiple times, it's likely that at some point uh, the answer and the response which are related are going to, to appear close together more often than, uh, than other. I'm simplifying a little bit because you need to be a little bit more fuzzy, but that's the essence of this. And uh, there is one gotcha with that. Uh, if you try to do that, uh, do not try to keep high frequency packets into it because you have some packets which are like 10 times a second so they're going to mess up your analysis so you need to actually get rid of all the high frequency packets before inserting it into it. So let me give you a concrete example. So far we've been doing a lot of hand waving. Uh, here is a uh, Le League of Legends uh, set skill packet. So every time you gain, you gain a level, uh, you have the ability to select a skill and say I want to increase this skill, this skill, or this skill. What you actually do is we pull out the trace for you and uh, in blue there is the opcode tree E and then you have 1B, 1C, 1A, 1B which is the second column which is basically uh, uh, the player ID. How we know that? We know that because if you use, if you look at one trace it's fixed. 
if you look at multiple tries with multiple players, it's actually become viable, so we know it's actually linked to the player. And then at the end you have zero, zero two, zero three, zero, et cetera, and it's actually come from zero zero to zero five, and then we took a dec deeper look at that by basically clicking on one of those slots and then looking at what packet we got by playing the game and looking at the, the output at the same time, and it's actually the slot position. So what the packet says is, uh, I want to put the player ID X, want to put one more point to this slot. And then you need the answer, right? And so we did this frequency analysis and then gram and we get the answer and the answer is 18. And so 18 is the same thing. You have the player ID followed by the slot position you actually said and then the server tell you how much you have. Right? So it basically tells you well for slot position 1 which is 0 0 uh, you get a skill between 0 1 and uh, 0 6 which is the maximum you can get for a given skill. And you look at that and you're like, mm hmm, is there a bug? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. yes, it seems to be there is a bug where you're like, well, if the server send me how much power I can get for a given slot, what happens if I re rewrite uh, 0, 01 to, let's say, 0, 06? So I get like, I said I'm going to assign one point and then I stop the packet from the server and I say, well, no, in reality, you don't get one more point, you get like six more points. It sort of works in the sense that, uh, your ser your client is going to believe that you actually have six. So your your client is going to believe what the server say and he's going to say yes, you have uh, a spell level six. But when you try to use it, it won't work because actually the server keeps tab of how much DPS you do. So actually, even you can pretend to have the skill, but it's actually not going to do anything because they do the computation on the server. I don't know when they fixed it, but it's fixed. All right. Another way to do it, uh, we found very useful, is uh, binding a specific uh, set of keystroke to our uh, to our keyboard before we're doing an action. So we actually say uh, we usually use Control uh, X, and so you we press Control X just before we want to the action we're interested in, and then uh, our software actually add to the to the trace so a, a click event into the trace. And after that, what we do is we usually look at the end few packet after that. So it's actually helping basically instrumenting the game and looking at the trace at the same time, putting the, uh, the click at that point is actually help us to isolate the packet we want to look at. If you don't want to do all the different analysis and stuff, the easiest way is just to record uh, a specific uh, sequence and say, well, I want you to know what are the packets from this particular point in time, and then you can actually look at only these packets. Again, what we want to come across is don't try to reverse the entire protocol because most of the protocol part are sort of independent. Just try to focus on the one you are really interested in, like attacking or setting an item or removing an item, and then just look at those packets. And if you look at enough of those packets, you're going to find a recurrence, and then with this, you can actually figure out how the protocol works. Um, and then for the next part, I'm going to let Patrick uh, tell you a little bit more how we monitor the result. Okay, so what about monitoring the results? Um, remember the bigger picture is to build a further, so we kind of need some way to automate uh, the monitoring of the results so that we can build some scripts, for example, that is going to check uh, whether or not we succeeded. Um, so why do I do, how do I do that? Uh, as my packet uh, affected the game state? Uh, to do that, uh, we need to read the state of the, uh, of the game. Um, we have a couple of ways to do that. Um, the first one is to read the, the game memory. So uh, we are going to inject a packet, and then we need to find the memory offsets of the potential value that is going to be affected. And this value will give us uh, an idea of how we succeeded in changing uh, the state of the game. For example, if we take the health of the player of the number of uh, gold pieces, uh, we can say that I have 10 gold and now I'm trying to buy an item and I have 11 gold. So 
did my injection worked. Um, now, how can I find the offset in the memory? Uh, the idea is to start with uh, the complete armor, for example, and uh, take a whole snapshot of the memory. Then you remove one piece of armor and you do the same thing. Uh, you filter all the values that didn't change and you keep the good stuff. And then you do it again. You change another piece of armor and you take another snapshot and filter the values. And again and again. And uh, at the end, it's likely that you will find uh, the, um, the relevant value uh, in a couple of iterations. Uh, what, uh, what if the offset is encrypted or obfuscated? Usually, um, not all the structure is encrypted. It's, it's only the interesting values. So you need to find a, a field in the structure, for example, the player structure, that is not encrypted. Uh, the idea is, uh, for instance, uh, in Diablo 3, uh, the goal value is not encrypted in the player structure. So uh, it's actually a float. So you can find this value and then uh, climb up or down in the structure to find the health uh, value. And then you get the offset uh, in this structure and you can get the actual uh, memory address. Um, another option would be to do more set and unset uh, on the value until you get only one value. But this can take a lot of time and a lot of iterations. Uh, if it's obfuscated, um, the thing that you can do is just look for a value that changes or do not changes and try to extract what, it's, uh, what is important for you. And then um, find out how it's obfuscated. Okay, so that's it for the game analysis JO. Um, thank you for coming. And you can follow us on Twitter or G.